of our program on the line with us is uh, our old buddy Barry W. Lynn, 25 years as executive director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, now retired, uh, and the author of a just released trilogy. It's titled Peace, Porn, and Prayer, a three book set. The first is about peace, the second is about porn, and the third is about prayer. <laughs> if you're watching, I, I'm just waving them around here. Barry has a uh, by the way, a theology degree from Boston University School of Theology and is also an attorney with a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. BarryWLynn.com is both his website and his Twitter handle. And Barry, welcome back to the program. It's been a while since we've talked. It has. It has been years. and I have missed it a great deal. Well, thank you for, for joining us today. I loved your books. As you know, I wrote a blurb that is on the back cover of, I think, the yes. very first one. Yes, here it is. Yes, right it here. is. And, and, yes, it is. And for people who are wondering this, uh, really, the, the, the title of the books, the title of the series, and I failed to mention that when I introduced you, I, I certainly should have, is Paid to Piss People Off. I mean, that's how you would find it if you're going to a bookstore or looking for it online, right? Paid to Piss People Off? That is absolutely right. And this is because a high school student came up to me once at a party and said, Mr. Lynn, I want to do what you do when I get out of school. And I said, Connor, what do you think I do? And he said... I think you get paid to piss people off. <laughs> I did explain that it was a little more complicated than that, yeah. but um, but he's very happy uh, that I took his words and turned it into the title. I thought it was just fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I loved the book, I, the books. Um, it, you know, the the first book, uh, you know, was kind of uh, parts of your life that I had no knowledge of. You know, how you grew right. up and the big influences in your life, and that's that's fascinating stuff. But then. The second and third books, where you get into the uh, into the the battles that you've been fighting. Well, there's some of that in the first book too. Um, the battles that you've been fighting uh, and and the positions you've been taking are just extraordinary. Uh, for example, in the second book, um, your your work against the Mies Commission and uh, showing up in Las Vegas and and uh, you know hanging out with the porn kings and stuff. I mean, this is some some amazing stuff. I mean, it, 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 tell us some stories here. It, 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 that, that's, I think, that's one of the more salacious <laughs> ones, so it's always a great place to start. It is a good place to start, but I want to tell you a slightly more salacious story based from that same era. Okay. The, the uh, Reagan administration to start a, decided to start a new pornography commission with the uh, effort to control what it called the dangers of pornography. And uh, s there were four women on the, on the commission and three of them at the end just dissented from the whole nonsense that they came up with. But one day they went to Houston, Texas, and there were two people who were allowed to come as private citizens on the bus that took them to three of the sleaziest bookstores I have ever seen. I don't want people to get mistaken. There are places, adult bookstores, adult novelty stores, in shopping centers now, lots of bright lights, um, dildos all lined up by size and color. These were not those kind of places. This was really terrible. So I find myself in a buddy booth, which for uh, folks who don't remember or wish they didn't remember this was a place where you could go and watch a little loop of eight millimeter film of people engaged in sex and you could bring a buddy and what you did with that buddy is up to you right. so i'm there we're watching this little loop i'm with ellen levine who was at the time the editor of woman's day magazine and henry hudson who was the head of the commission now sadly a federal judge in virginia so we're watching two gay men wearing green monster masks engaging in sex and henry hudson turns to me and he said you know barry when you testified before the uh, commission uh, you said all these images have meanings what's the meaning of this I looked at him, I said, try it, you might like it. <laughs> he uh, he didn't, guy. but Ellen Levine really already was souring in the thing, and she, she had enormous trouble just not breaking out in the kind of response you yeah. just gave me. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and uh, for people who don't remember the 80s, I, I always thought the Meese Commission <laughs> was one of the most insane things. I mean, here, Ed Meese and a bunch of other uh, men, mostly, I mean, you know, yep. they, they got together and watched, I think they claimed that they had watched something like 600 hours of pornography 
uh, between them. Yep. I mean, you know, yep. including hardcore. Uh, in fact, it was all hardcore, uh, including child porn, all kinds of pornography. Yes, and they then did. They, and then they came out and they said, we can tell you with certainty that this stuff damages people. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Uh, you know, you're still standing? You're functioning? Yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was crazy. The, the Washington Post actually did a piece toward the end of the commission's life that said, um, where they asked people whether this all this porn had had any effect on them. And most people said, no, it, it didn't. And then one or two said, well, ask me in five years. <laughs> but you know, the, the thing that they didn't take seriously, uh, there was simultaneous to this kind of uh, uh, traditional conservatives, we don't like uh, what people are doing, we sure don't want to see them doing it. The um, They had a an opportunity to listen and take seriously some of the feminist critique of pornography, right. which was going on at the same time with Catherine McKinnon and her, her activist uh, friend, Andrea Dworkin. And they testified, but they were they just were totally ignored. Right. And although Catherine and, and, and I and Andrea, when she was still alive, had lots of debates and lots of discussions. I thought they were making some very important points that yeah. could have been taken up, and which, ironically, I took to the ACLU board. And it was one of the few things that I took to the ACLU board that they didn't approve, and that was to create a cause of action for sexual privacy violations. If you were an a child, if you were a person coerced into pornography, you have no, in most cases, you have no remedy whatsoever. Right. And I think you should, yeah. because there's no question. I think there's no question that there was an overestimation of this kind of activity, but nevertheless, uh, there was something, and I think something could have been done to lead us in the right direction. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Barry, we, yeah. have, we have limited time here, and these three books sure. cover so much territory. I, I, I also wanted to get into the, the main work of your life, or a large chunk of the work of your life, which was Americans United Against, you know, uh, uh, for the separation of church and state. Right. And uh, I, I thought it was sweet that you uh, you were mentioning yeah. John Fugel saying in one of your books, who, who uh, John and I talk about this on the air all the time. You know, these sure. these issues, the the the, the Christian right that that uh, frankly, if if Jesus showed up, they'd probably do everything they could to get him thrown in jail. Um, <laughs> well, where, they might even crucify him again. I, I, absolutely, yeah. I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at all. So, what is uh, a you know? Do you have any interesting stories you'd like to tell about that? We've got about uh, I think three minutes left. Um, okay. and, or B, what is the state of the separation of church and state now compared to where we were at in the '80s when you were you know really uh, you know, sure. much of your book takes place? Yeah, I think that the state of the separation of church and state is in deep trouble now, and I think it was approaching deep trouble even at the time before I retired. But I will say that um, we cannot give up. There's one lesson to be learned, I hope, from the, all three of these books, and that is you cannot ever give up, and possibly, secondarily, don't ever lose your sense of humor. But I will tell you that on issues particularly on the funding of religious schools, uh, New York Times called me recently, said, is there anything left of the wall in that regard? And I said, uh, not much. Just en envision the largest cannonball you can ever find and imagine what it would take out of a wall in your backyard. And I said, that's pretty much where it is. It yeah. is in deep trouble. There is a solution though. It is expanding the United States Supreme Court to add five more seats. Because, and you point this out in your book, that it was the Supreme Court that said that if you're going to, as a state, if you're gonna do a voucher system, and now Arizona and Florida have both gone entire statewide. Everybody in the state can get a free yep. voucher. The voucher doesn't fully cover the cost of most private schools. So the people using these vouchers will be the upper middle class and the wealthy. Um, and so it's basically a subsidy of rich people. Um, and, and you're going to end up with, you know, the schools essentially ghettoized, you know, with just uh, low income people. Sure. Um, but uh, the, the Supreme Court said if you're going to give money to private schools, you also have to give it to religious schools. And that was such a, a, a crime against the founders, in my mind. There's no question about that. The idea that anyone setting up the country would think 
first of all, they didn't even have a lot of public schools. But once they made a commitment to public education, that was in fact what you were going to assume would take care of most, if not all, students. If you want to set up a private school system or have a private school in your community, God bless you. And by the way, they're almost all allegedly God blessed. They're almost all religious. Mm -hmm. But for Pete's sake, don't expect people. This is like going uh, and saying, you know, I don't like the fire department in my uh, neighborhood. I would like everybody to subsidize my own fire hose so I can do it myself. Right. That is irresponsible and yeah. worse when it comes to children's education. Yeah. And, and they're asking us to fund it. And this is now you know, a, a, a nationwide movement. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary trilogy here, Paid to Piss People Off by Barry W. Lynn. Book one, peace, book two, porn, book three, prayer. It is, you'll love reading this stuff, so check it out. Barry, thanks so much for dropping by today. Absolutely, happy to do it. And, and thank you for writing these books. It's a, they're, they're a genuine contribution to, to, to our dialogue and our society. Barry W. Wonderful. Thank you, Barry. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we'll be right back at 17 minutes past the hour.